Uh, just a, a quick introduction about Estreos. Uh, if you can flip to the next slide, Tony. Uh, uh, for those who are joining it for the first time here, Estreos webinar. Um, we are Estreos, you know, founded in 2016. And what we do is we are a software company which builds solutions for drilling, blasting, and mining applications. Our solution is used in eight different countries in eight, roughly 800 mines and quarries. Uh, and we have teams across the globe here in America, Asia, Europe, and Australia. And that gives us ability to do 24 by seven customer support. Um, so the next slide uh, essentially you know, entails how, what we do um, as a solution here is we are uh, consider ourselves as a mine to mill AI platform where you can design uh, your blast. So starting is, you know, you can do surveying, data collection, uploading our platform, design uh, your drill pattern, do all kinds of analysis related to blast optimization and predict things as well. What's the shape of the muck pile would be fragmentation and vibrational results would be along with the geotechnical uh, rock mass analysis here. And now once the blast has been executed, uh, there are various tools for the assessment that we have, which is fragmentation, uh, muck pile heave analysis, along with the uh, mesh oil drilling analysis here. And combining all this together, which is design, predict and assessment in one specific platform, gives a leverage to run optimization for any of your projects in a much more seamless way. So that's why we have optimization uh, as one of the tools which identifies pattern, uh, identifies ideal design parameters, uh, and then models KPI tracking you know, from that. Um, so yeah, that's just a quick overview of his trails. And uh, for the moment you've been waiting, uh, over to Dr. Konya. Yeah, good morning, everybody, and good morning, Ravi and Kim. Thank you guys for having me uh, on here and, and for this presentation. Uh, looking forward to it. And before we jump in, I do want to give just a little bit uh, more about my background and some of my uh, work in the explosives arena. So uh, I, I'm currently the president and the owner of Precision Blasting Services. We're a blast engineering firm that specializes in helping mining and construction clients improve and optimize their drilling and blasting performance. Um, one of the things with this is Ravi and I have had the chance to work together uh, in, in some of these Strayos platforms. And uh, as that, our company actually uses the Strayos platform. I think it's a fantastic tool and um, definitely happy to present here and be working with you guys on that. Um, I'm also the president and owner of Academy Blasting, Academy Blasting TV, and some of those other things geared really towards educating people in the drilling and blasting realm. That's one of my major passions is trying to help make sure that we increase the art and the science of blasting uh, through releasing information that would otherwise be hard to find or difficult to uh, really get to. I'm the developer of the modern pre-splitting theory uh, and design practices under the precision pre-splitting applications that's now been accepted by companies all over the world. It's used uh, everywhere from coal to gold mining to quarrying to construction. It's the only current accepted method of pre-split design by the U.S. Department of Defense and several other uh, both private and public organizations. I have over 100 technical publications in drilling and blasting. Those are uh, typically geared towards written publications and then um, probably several hundred different presentations and webinars and, and other forms of uh, educational media such as that. I also taught at Colorado School of Mines in their explosives engineering department and I taught and still teach at the Missouri University of Science and Technology uh, in at Missouri s and that's really geared towards the construction blasting application. I have a bachelor's in mining engineering, then a master's and a PhD in explosives engineering. And I've experienced all across the world. I've worked in Asia, Africa, Europe, South America, North America, all 50 states in the US um, and most of the provinces up in Canada um, and worked in all different sort of arenas. So. A lot of that is in that blast design process and how we design blasts to uh, get better performance from all the different variables that we're looking at when we're trying to determine how a blast is going to function. Um, in explosives engineering, including things such as weapon systems, blast design structures, uh, explosive manufacturing plants. I've done a lot of work in vibration control and developed uh, the new equations that are used by groups such as the US Army Corps of Engineers for predicting ground vibration from production and pre-split blasting. 
I have extensive experience in underwater blasting. We currently have multiple projects underway across the US on this realm. Again, I've done a lot of work in precision pre-splitting, underground blasting on explosive manufacturing, including designing and building uh, explosive manufacturing plants all over uh, the world, including Asia, Africa, Europe, and North America. And so that's just a brief background on myself. Um, what we're really going to focus on here today is oversize, and that goes into that blast design realm. And what we're really going to talk about is how blast design affects oversized generation and how we can manipulate certain variables in that blast design process to minimize the amount of oversize that's generated. I'll mention right off the bat there, if you're looking for more information, uh, this past year I was asked to write a four article series on overcoming oversize for Pitt and Quarry. It was published, I believe it was um, May, June, July, and August edition. And you can find that on their website under the digital editions version. It's, there's no charge to access those. Now the general outline for this webinar and what we're gonna talk about is very similar to what we discussed or what was written about in that Overcoming Oversized article series, except we're gonna go a little bit more in depth in certain areas, especially on more of the uh, design side of, of the spectrum. We're gonna start by discussing where oversize comes from in general as we're blasting. From there, we'll discuss how we overcome cap rock problems We'll talk about spacing solutions and how we optimize spacing to minimize oversize in the mid column or the middle of the blast. We'll ask the question and try to answer it, is bigger always better? And then we'll finally, we'll move into how we eliminate or break the back break and the oversize that comes as a result of back break. And so that's just a general guideline. As we go through, we're gonna sort of dissect each of these individual locations and discuss specific solutions that you can implement to solve those problems. Now, the first thing we have to do is we have to start with a good definition. What is oversize? And really, this is going to be a topic that's going to vary on a site by site basis. So, for example, in some smaller quarries, we may classify anything over 24 inches or 0.6 meters in diameter as oversize. And that is really going to be a limitation typically on the crushing system. Sometimes it's on the loading system, depending on the quarry. Uh, either the front end loader, the excavator, or the typically um, the jaw crusher, whatever primary crushing system they're using is going to have some limitation in place that is going to normally classify oversize as smaller material, which in a metal mine may not be an issue. In large open pit mining operations, maybe we'll consider some material that exceeds 48 inches or larger in diameter. I also saw uh, some people on, on this webinar here that I've had the uh, good fortune of being able to work with in the past. And I know some of their sites, they use huge PH 4100 or 4800 shovels. And maybe to them, a 48 inch uh, diameter particle is nothing and they can easily handle it and it's not a concern. And so we, we have to first understand that oversize is going to vary on a site by site basis. Now, one of the introductory concepts that, that we should also work with is the fact that when oversize varies like this, we need to be able to scale everything. And that includes throughout the entire blast design process. So most people would probably laugh at the idea of using, let's say a three inch diameter borehole in a large open pit coal mine with 200 foot faces. It, it would just be an inefficient system and it would cause way more breakage than we would need. At the same time, we're not gonna go into a small quarry and use a 16 inch diameter borehole because by using those different sizes, by using that larger size, we know we're gonna get larger rock in general. And so the first cr classification is what is our oversize and do we have a general appropriate design to deal with that uh, sort of underlying problem? And this is one of the things uh, you can see here, this is from that Strayo software, but what it's showing is that Kuzram fragmentation model. And this is one of the first places we start whenever we're looking at a new project is we'll start by using the Kuzram model. We'll run that and we'll see, does the current blasting operation make sense? Meaning, is, is this site using, let's say, a six inch diameter hole, and that in itself is causing a lot of problems because we would expect to get a large percentage of material over 24 inches or 0.6 meters, and the site is aiming to keep everything below that. And in that case, we would need to go to a smaller drill diameter. Now, what we're going to assume in the entirety of this webinar here is that we are already at the point where 
we are using an appropriate blast design to some general sense. We don't have major inefficiencies happening because uh, we're using design elements that are completely out of the normal. And what we're going to talk about then is how we actually go about optimizing once we have a general ballpark appropriate design in place. And so one, one final note before we get into uh, talking about more a little bit more in depth on oversizes that in the world of blast engineering, whenever we're looking at, at trying to control a blasting operation to get certain results, our goal is always going to be to achieve a minimal amount of rock that is considered oversized. Now, there are other performance criteria in any blast that we also have to consider. So, for example, maybe that's fines generation. Maybe that's the mean size of the rock that we're getting. Maybe it's ground vibration, air over pressure, muck pile placement. We're, we have to work with all of these different what we call controllable, controllable variables. And these are going to be variables that based on the decisions we make in the blast design process, we're going to have an influence on. And so we never want we never want to say we have no oversize because maybe in some cases it's better to have one, two, three boulders from a blast that are oversized, um, but we can break using secondary breakage mechanisms than to, let's say, sacrifice performance in another area. So the first thing we're going to talk about is oversized locations. And this is going to be one of the most critical parts of trying to overcome oversize. It's going to be determining why that oversize is occurring in the first place. We can't just say, well, there's oversize in the blast, so we have to increase the powder factor. Because maybe there's that has nothing to do with the powder factor involved. Maybe there's other reasons that oversize is occurring. And that's what we need to consider, and that's what we need to discover. Now, one of the first locations that the majority of sites I see have oversized, especially on the quarrying application, is in the top of the bench. And we typically call this cap rock. So it's going to be somewhere normally in the stemming zone. Um, it can be slightly under the stemming zone. And it makes sense that we get oversized here because we really don't have a lot of explosive in there or any explosive. And if we're not doing something that's going to cause this to move and bend, well, we're not going to get good breakage. On top of that, we typically will, for some reason, every site almost has a hard layer of rock right at that cap. They have a big, massive area of rock there. And a lot of times that's by general selection. You know, we choose our benches to an easy breakage plane typically, so we minimize the amount of subdrilling we have to do. And what that typically does is it, it ends up ending that bench that's above the shock um, at that hard seam and then giving us that hard seam in the actual uh, following bench right in that stemming zone. The second place we can have oversized is what we call the middle of the bench, and that's that green rectangle you see here. It's right next to the borehole or somewhere near that general borehole region, um, slightly above grade. We'll typically say this is something like 50 to 70 percent of the burden above grade. So what do I mean? Let's say we have a 10-foot burden, that would mean that the start of this middle of the bench here would be roughly five to seven feet from our intended grade that you can see represented by this black line here. The next location is at grade. And so that at grade location is gonna be anywhere near the bottom, typically under that 50 to 70% of the burden from the intended grade above. And you can see that here by this blue square. And finally, we have what we call the outside of the burden. And that's gonna be right in the front. This is typically only on the first row of holes for that uh, specific blast. And this is gonna be right on the front. And this is gonna be material that's typically already broken. It's hanging onto the face. There's no easy way to get explosives into it. And it's when the blast goes off, it's just gonna get pushed forward uh, with the rest of the blast. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go through each of these individual locations, and we're going to find where specifically we're getting cap rock from. And if we can identify we have, um, let's say, cap rock occurring, how do we treat that? If we identify that we're getting oversized at grade, how do we go about treating that? But before we go into that, we're going to have our first poll here of the morning, and that should be sent out here uh, in the chat on the webinar. And the question is, what locations do you typically get oversized from? And Ravi and Kim, is there a way that we're getting that sent out there? Yes, now we're gonna be uh, opening up our first poll. 
And so if you guys can see your screen, it should pop up. Leave the poll open for 30 seconds here and see the responses. Yeah, so it's a good mix here. Definitely the top of the blast is getting the most responses here. Yeah, and the front of the blast as well. So we'll give another five seconds and we'll close the poll. All right, so it's definitely the winner is top of the blast. All uh, right. Great, so we're gonna, that's actually uh, the next one, the next topic we'll talk about. We'll talk next about how we deal with cap rock. Now, we can have cap rock or oversize at the top of the blast occur for multiple reasons. One of those reasons can be using too much stemming. So remember when we're using stemming, the reason we use stemming is we're actually trying to maintain proper efficiency of the explosive. And so the stemming is locking in those gas pressures and it's allowing for them to do their work long enough that the face starts to move and break and flex and then the stemming, uh, the pressure in the borehole decreases and the stemming should just drop out of the top of that hole. We normally don't wanna see the stemming eject because when that happens, we're basically burning dollar bills above the blast. We're losing the energy of the explosive and we now have a less efficient explosive taking place. At the same time, when we design the stemming, we wanna optimize that length of stemming to make sure we don't have too much that we're gonna artificially lead to increased uh, increase cap rock there. Now, another reason we may get oversized at the top of the bench is if we have a hard, competent seam there, especially then the fact that we're putting stemming into it, that's getting the least bending and the least flexure on uh, the entire shot. So we know that the face here, the blast, it's going to bend out nicely, but oftentimes the stemming zone is lagged behind. So one of the things we can do is we can design a blast with what we're going to talk about later called stiffness ratio. We'll talk about that on a couple minutes here. And when we have a high stiffness ratio, the top of the bench will actually lift up slightly and that can help to break some of that cap rock. When we have really hard, competent rock up at the top and we have stemming in it, we typically need to rely on additional methods and techniques to help break that. Now, there's multiple methods that can be used or have been discussed to be used. One of the ways to do this and one of the uh, maybe better ways to do it, it really helps to break the material, but it can also lead to additional costs, um, is to go to a smaller diameter drill. So again, when we go to that smaller drill, we'll talk about how that increases the stiffness or the slenderness of the blast. And that allows for an actual upward motion to some of the stemming. It's not a blowout here, but it's just a slight bend upward as this material sort of rolls here at the top. And that helps to lead to a lot better breakage in the top. We can also use small stab holes between blast holes. And what that would be is, let's say we had a row of holes here. We could put a hole in between every single hole, drill that maybe to halfway through the stemming, put a small charge in there, and fire that small charge during the normal blast in an attempt to help break up the cap rock. And this is a common technique that, that has been tried at a number of sites, but unfortunately most sites don't continue the practice. And the reason is, is we really don't get the breakage that we should or that we would anticipate getting from uh, those stab holes. The reason we don't get that breakage, it goes back to what we call cratering theory. And we're gonna talk about that here in a minute along with some other techniques that have been tried and used in the past. And that other technique is stem charges. Now, stem charges can be controversial because at some sites, people have tried them and they haven't worked. And the reason that stem charges don't necessarily work or haven't worked in a lot of sites in the past is because they relied on what we call cratering theory. Now, there were some great researchers in, in blast cratering, guys like uh, Dr. Charles Livingston, who formed the Livingston cratering equations, and they were great for designing a cratering blast. The problem is they don't really work in the drilling and blasting arena well. And the reason is, is we, we have to make a choice when we place a stem charge in the stemming. 
we can either place that stem charge high up in the stemming to the point that it's going to form a little bit wider crater, but it only knocks off a small area of the actual cap rock there. Or we can place it deep in the stemming. And when we place it deep in the stemming, that's going to blow out to the surface. It's going to be very narrow in its overall uh, effect. It's not going to necessarily work two, three feet out. It's going to work in sort of a narrow, narrow cone, and it's going to break the rock going up around the hole. Well, typically, the rock around the hole is already broken to some extent, and so the stem charges haven't worked in some of those areas. The other big reason stem charges are complicated is because they typically blow out the stemming, especially if you don't time them properly. And when you have the stem charges blow out the stemming, what ends up happening is we prematurely release the stemming, which allows for a premature release of the gases generated by the explosive, which then leads to a whole host of other problems, including more oversized forming in other areas of the blast. So what, what this led to was there was a lot of work done to try to develop techniques for designing stem charges based on cratering theory. And again, it led to the stem charges traditionally being placed too high in the stemming column. They were placed well above where they should have been in order to try to break a wider berth of that rock and that ended up leading to stemming blowout, which led to, again, an inefficient blast design. And so, again, we really, not only do we need to properly place the stem charge, but we also need to properly time the stem charge. And we're going to talk about both of those here. So when we're designing the stem charge, the main goal of a stem charge is to allow it to do work through what we call the borehole effect. This is not cratering where we're trying to break a crater to the surface. This is where we're taking that explosive and we're using the side of the explosive the same way we do in a normal borehole to break forward into that burden of the blast. We also want to make sure that it can do this without compromising the stemming that's already placed in the borehole and causing a more inefficient blast for the rest of that explosive product. So we have an equation we can use to then determine the depth of burial, the depth of burial of the stem charge based on this borehole effect principle. And here's an important piece to this. Our stem charge should always have a diameter less than the diameter of the overall borehole. So if we're using a bulk explosive, let's say we have that in a six inch hole or 150 millimeter hole, we are gonna want to use a stem charge that has a significantly smaller diameter. So maybe our stem charge is gonna be three inches or two and a half inches or two inches in diameter. And again, the goal is to get it to break that material, to radially fracture it, and to cause some type of flexural failure afterwards from that borehole effect. And so what we can do then is we can look to see where we wanna place that charge at what depth and design either the depth of burial directly from the charge diameter, or we can reverse and design the charge diameter based off of our intended depth of burial. Why would we do that? Well, let's say we know we have a hard, competent cap rock seam that's five feet thick, or let's, let's go with six feet thick, just under two meters thick. So ideally, we wanna place our stem charge right about in the middle of that hard seam of cap rock. And so in that case, we would want a depth of burial of let's say three feet or one meter, roughly one meter down. We can then design the charge diameter we need and source that product in order to put it at that exact location. And the equation we use to design these is shown here. So we have the depth of burial in feet is equal to 1.4 times the specific gravity of the explosive in grams per cc divided by the specific gravity of the rock. We take this number, we add one to that, and we multiply that by the diameter of the explosive. So again, if we wanted to pick a depth of burial and design the diameter, we would just divide the depth of burial by this number here, and we can then design our explosive diameter. So you can use this equation going both ways to either choose the location or choose your explosive diameter. The next question becomes, how do we time these? And more importantly, how do we time these economically? See, that's one of the problems stem stab holes have always had. And it was in the fact that we could never find an economic way to actually apply them, even if we could get them to work well. 
you're talking expensive initiators, expensive primers, a very small amount of charge, and a lot of extra drilling. So one of the benefits of stem charges is we eliminate all of that extra drilling. In the actual explosive product itself, the stick of dynamite or the stick of cap sensitive emulsion that we may use for the stem charge, it really doesn't add a significant amount of cost to any real uh, larger sized operation or medium sized operation. There's almost no difference there. The difference is made, however, in the initiator and in that cast booster. That's where we start to really increase the costs of these uh, stem charges. On top of that, how do we properly design the timing then? Do we have the stem charge go off first, which may break that rock and then cause poor stemming to occur where all of that main charge can blow out of the hole? Or do we design it to go off after the normal shot where now the actual explosive has gone off, but if that stemming ejects, that means we may have a charge going off somewhere in open air. Neither of those are good solutions. And the, the easy answer is, well, let's time it to go off at the same time as the normal charge. And that sounds great in principle. The problem is cap scatter. If we're using non-electric or electric caps, I know in some parts of the world, they still use a lot of electric caps. So if we're using one of those methods, we have cap scatter that we say can be plus or minus 10% of the actual delay. So if we're using a 500 millisecond downhole delay, that cap is going off somewhere between 450 and 550 milliseconds. Even with electronics, let's say we just have one millisecond of delay of, of cap scatter there. Well, if we have one millisecond of delay, that could still potentially cause some issues, although not as major issues, but our cost is now substantially higher because the electronic caps are even more expensive than the non-electric or electric. So what's the solution? Well, what we typically do is we would get, let's say two sticks of dynamite or two sticks of cap sensitive emulsion or water gel. We would take the first stick, We'd wrap detonating cord around that. We'd put that into the top of the explosive column. We would start our stemming. We'd stem up to where that second, that real stem charge goes, and the detonating cord would go right through that stemming. And then it would be wrapped around that second, the actual stem charge there. We'd place that into the hole with the detonating cord, and we stem on top of that. And now what that does is that as that borehole detonates from the bottom, it goes up, it hits that detonating cord, has that propagation continue and has the stem charge fire at exactly the time that it should without having to use an additional initiation system. So we're substantially reducing the cost of using these stem charges. And now really the major cost isn't necessarily even in the explosive product. It's in that additional typical labor cost uh, that it takes to actually implement these and, and tie these in and put them into the borehole. And so that's how we stem uh, and design those stem charges to be efficient, to break that cap rock up much better, um, and to be timed properly without necessarily having a, a large increase in cost. Next, we'll talk about mid-column oversize. And this is a more rare event, and we could see that as well in the poll that was done, that not a lot of people are running into mid-column oversize, which is a good thing because mid-column oversize typically signals that there's material or very real and major problems in the actual blast design process. Now we typically won't see mid-column oversize in the muck pile, we nor, or excuse me, at the top of the muck pile like we do cap rock. See, everybody sees the, the material that's part of the stemming. We all can identify that material, the large oversize sitting on top of the muck pile after the blast. It's a little bit harder to see if there's oversize in the actual shot or in the bottom of the shot. And really the only way we'll know this is if the loader um, operator notifies us that there's a problem. And this is one reason that we recommend every loader operator keeps what we call a dig log. And maybe all that that dig log is, is a breakdown of where they're digging in the muck pile on a 30 minute basis and what that digging is like. Or maybe it's as simple as check the box where you find material that you believe is oversized or harder to dig and it's broken down to top of muck pile, middle of muck pile, bottom of muck pile. Whatever that is, we want some way that the loader operator is identifying, logging, 
and then submitting that to the blast engineering group so we can identify is there other problems going on in the middle of the blast that we're not seeing when we do an analysis right off the top of the muck pile. Again, this is this dig logs can be very similar to a drill log. And in general, what we recommend is having some type of time and or a location of digging with a general rating of the ease of or difficulty of digging. So maybe that's a scale of one to five and the operator just writes in, this area of the blast was a three, it was sort of in the middle on digging. This area here was a one, it was very easy to dig. And this spot right here, it was a five. There was something really difficult about digging that spot. That's the easiest form of this, but it gives us a lot of information to understand where some problems are occurring, not just with oversize, but maybe with not properly plugged to grade, um, maybe with some other uh, problems, let's say on the heave end, we're not getting good enough heave or scatter of that muck pile. So the operator is having a much more difficult time digging. There's a lot of reasons that that can occur, um, but at minimum, we wanna know that it is occurring. Now we can also do multiple drone flights, and this would be something I'd recommend for everybody when we're looking at doing a fragmentation analysis, we don't just wanna do one flight right in the beginning. And this is one of the major benefits of having drones. I remember back when we used to have to take the cameras and take pictures and we'd stop production, we'd lay out different scaling metrics, we take a bunch of pictures of it, we go back and then three hours later, we come back into the site, put it down a bunch of markers again, take a bunch of pictures, leave again and do that on and off all day. The problem with that is it leads to major downtime losses on all of the equipment there. It significantly slows down the overall uh, load muck haul process. And today with the drone flights, we don't necessarily have to do that. We can fly a drone every 30 minutes if we wanted to and never have to shut production down um, as long as that drone's not causing some type of safety risk, which typically it's not. And what we can do then is we can get the 3D fragmentation analysis using a software like Straos from multiple different parts as we go uh, through the entire process. And when we do that, uh, we can actually go about pulling together uh, all of that information from multiple different points in time. We can eliminate data that we're let's say gonna put in three, four times because that part of the muck pile hasn't changed. We can put in all the new surfaces and then compile that into one fragmentation curve for the blast that really lets us see how the entire blast has trended. Now, we call this next section spacing solutions. And really that's because it's geared towards solving the problem of oversize in the mid column here. Now we can get oversized for two reasons in the mid column or two major reasons. There's several other reasons that can occur, but we really see it in two major forms. The first is that the spacing between boreholes is too small. And we can see a representation of this here. So we have boreholes here firing in a row and the spacing here is too small based on the hole to hole timing. And what happens is we get a splitting action between the holes here we generate a significant amount of fines between the holes. And then in front of the holes here, we end up uh, not having proper breakage and that leads to oversized forming in the burden in front of the holes. We can also get oversized occurring if our spacing is too large for the hole to hole timing. And I should mention that spacing being large or small is a function of a lot of different variables, including the bench height, the burden, the stiffness ratio, the explosive type, the explosive diameter, the hole to hole timings, another important consideration here. So when we're saying too large or too small, it's all subjective to the individual location and what's going on there. Now, if our spacing is too large, then what we end up doing is we break to the burden, but we don't get good overlap between these holes. And in this case, what a lot of times will happen we can get a sawtooth look here, or we'll actually cause some breakage to occur between the holes still, and we'll get large boulders and oversize then between holes uh, in that actual spacing region. And we can see this from the final face of the blast. So when we have blast holes with too close spacing, we get a sawtooth look where the breakage goes behind the row of holes. So here's the row of holes. The burden was out here towards the top of the screen and we're getting breakage behind the holes with the borehole. Maybe we'll even get a half cast appearing right here on the tip of this pinnacle. With too large spacing, we get the opposite effect occurring. So now we're getting this, this sawtooth effect with the rock breaking 
in front of the holes. So now again, the free face was toward the top of the screen and we're getting breakage here. And as I mentioned, a lot of times we'll still get some shearing here just because the rock normally doesn't like to sit like this. So we'll see a lot of boulders then right in the back, right up against the face or where every single row of holes was, we'll notice that we get large boulders in between holes. And that's a common uh, feature of our spacing being too large here. Now, the real question that I'm assuming everyone asks is, does this happen in real life? Well, here's a picture, for example, of a site. And we can see here this sawtooth effect. The sun was hitting this picture just perfectly so we could get the shadows being projected. And you can see on the front of all of these pinnacles here, we have a borehole or a half cast. That's where the boreholes actually sat when the shot went off. And so right away, that tells us the spacing is too close on the shot and we're causing breakage back. This is not a geologic problem. It has nothing to do with the geology of the site. This is purely it's the spacing is too close in the shot. So how do we correct it? First, we need to start with a good blast design. And so we can use this equation. Now this equation for spacing relies on a lot of different things. One of which is the stiffness ratio of the blast, which we're gonna talk about here in a minute, has to be less than four. We also are assuming that the boreholes are delayed by somewhere around one and a half milliseconds per foot. Now, if we vary a little bit between there, one millisecond per foot of spacing to two milliseconds per foot of spacing, we're, we're probably not gonna see much problems. We may be able to optimize a little bit in there, um, but if we're gonna substantially change that, let's say we have a 10 foot spacing and our hole to hole timing is 100 milliseconds, so our timing is 10 milliseconds per foot, uh, then this equation probably wouldn't be uh, extremely helpful. It'll get us in the ballpark, but we'll need a lot of optimization from there. And so this equation says that our spacing is gonna be equal to seven times the burden plus the bench height divided by eight. And I do see a question, um, we're gonna save questions, answering a lot of questions for the end, but it, it's very timely here. Um, and, and this equation here is for production blasting. It's not for pre-splitting or for trim blasting. This is our production blasting spacing equation. And so this is a very simple, easy to use sort of equation that gets us in the right ballpark. And then from there, the blast engineering process takes over and we need to start monitoring what's actually going on and looking at where the fragmentation's having problems, what those locations are. We wanna to look to see if there's sawtooth effects occurring on the free face. We wanna be able to use a tool that we can import the pre-blast borehole locations, not the design, but the as-built, where let's say like in the Strayo system, we'll fly a drone, we'll pick up the collars the AI will pick up the collars of the boreholes and we'll save that data. So afterwards we can come back, put those holes in their actual pre-blast locations and see first what's the fragmentation doing. And secondly, is there any features we're observing on the face that are gonna line up, let's say between these boreholes or right on them. And then what we'll do is we'll adjust the blasting as we progress to see what those changes in fragmentation and the final face profile would be. So here we'll open up the second poll and that question is what is your spacing currently? The answers are too large, too small, or if you have your spacing just right. And you can use this sort of subjectively or you can use that equation here uh, in the next couple seconds where that spacing is seven times the burden plus the bench height, all of that divided by eight and compare that to what you guys are currently using. So the poll is on, we'll leave it on for 20 seconds or so. You can click on the poll to link inside the box to submit, uh, to get to the poll itself. You can also uh, click on the bar graphs in the top right hand corner of your screen to reach the poll. Great. So we'll leave it another five seconds. I think there's a really good mix here, uh, but definitely leaning towards just right 
and the second best response is too small. Yeah, and typically what we actually see is normally the spacing's too small as opposed to too large. A lot of people will uh, design their spacing to be the same as their burden. And when we have that occurring, that's when we get, we, we really start seeing these sawtooth effects because having the spacing equal to the burden just works in a very small percentage of situations when we have very short benches. Other than that, we normally want to open the spacing up. I did see a comment in here of uh, 1.15 to 1.25 times the burden. That works. That's A lot of that's based on the equilateral triangle pattern. And that really works when your stiffness ratio is somewhere around a two to two and a half. If we go larger than that, then our spacing can actually open up to 1.4 times the burden. And then based on how we're timing the blast and how we're sequencing the blast, um, in some situations, we can open up the spacing to be double the burden without really sacrificing a lot on the fragmentation, but it really helps us on uh, economically blasting a project. So we'll continue. The next is going to be at grade oversize. And at grade oversize, where we're actually getting oversize occurring at the floor of the blast, is typically caused by design problems and improper breakage mechanisms. This is often going to result in the most difficult drilling on site. And normally when the loader operator is saying that they're having the, the worst time in their loading process, let's say their highest rating on the most difficult digging, especially if we're using a front end loader, that's typically going to occur when we have a lot of oversize at grade or when we have uh, material that's fractured but not fully broken at grade. And there's a lot of reasons this can occur as well. Um, the first of those is improper subdrill. And so we know that if we're not subdrilling properly, we're not going to break properly to grade. We're going to leave high spots. Um, the spacing problems can actually also result in toes being formed. Uh, but what we're going to focus on here is really more on the breakage mechanism side. And that's where the question comes up, is bigger always better? You know, we've seen this question asked in a lot of different ways throughout a lot of different areas of life, and especially in the mining industry. We consistently are getting bigger and bigger with all of our equipment, with all of our products. And we're always trying to sort of improve that productivity by going to larger material or larger equipment. And what we typically see, especially working with sites sometimes for a decade, let's say, is almost every site goes through the same sequence. They start off at a certain point and they determine that because they want to cut costs, they're going to do that in the drilling and blasting process, and they go to larger drill diameters. So they start going from, a, let's say, a, a six-inch hole. They start to go up to an eight-inch hole or 150 millimeter to 200 millimeter, and they consistently increase. And they believe that this is saving them money in the blasting process. And a lot of times it is because they're using less initiators. They have less uh, total, um, sometimes explosive being used if they have improper design. There's a lot of reasons that that could potentially lead to upfront cost savings. The problem is, is then we start to get poor performance from the blast. And because we're getting that poor performance, the mines typically start to look at the total mine to mill optimization or what's that cost of going through the entire process? How is this poor performance now causing worse loading, worse hauling? How is it increasing wear on all my equipment, including my crusher? How much time are we spending on secondary breakage? When we do that, we start to see then the opposite occur and the sites start to go to a smaller and smaller diameter drill. And that is again in an effort to go and now improve blast performance. So we minimize the total cost of the mine to mill cycle instead of just the drilling and blasting costs. And this leads to the question, which of these methodologies is correct? Is it better to have a larger diameter blast hole for lower upfront blasting costs, but we have worse performance? Or is it better to have a smaller diameter blast hole for better performance, but we're gonna have a higher overall drill and blast cost? And luckily we have a very simple method which helps us answer this question. And it is called the stiffness ratio of the blast. We have a simple little equation we can use to actually determine the stiffness ratio. So we take the bench height and we divide that bench height by the burden. Once we get this ratio, we can get some general idea of the results we predict from the blast. So if we have a stiffness ratio of one, we're going to get high oversize, high amounts of oversize, high amounts of fines. We're going to get toes left at grade, high ground vibration, high air overpressure. 
and we're going to have a very violent blast. Conversely, if we have a stiffness ratio of four, we get minimal oversize, minimum fines. We typically don't get any toe left at the grade, good ground vibration, good air overpressure, and we get very low violence. Now we can go well above four. I fired blasts up to a stiffness ratio of 16. It's not that anything gets worse or you can't do it. Uh, the drill deviation increases and typically we could do the blasting for cheaper if we're above four. Um, but sometimes there's extenuating circumstances that we don't want to that we don't want to let's say increase the diameter and go to a smaller stiffness ratio and so people can shoot well above four as long as they can control the drill deviation uh, on the project there now one of the other things we found is that when we use proper design techniques we actually get some of the lowest powder factors at a stiffness ratio of four and the reason for this is because as we increase when we start, let's say, very low, a stiffness ratio of one, that means our burden is equal to our bench height. Let's say we have a little bit of a sub drill in there. We're now putting the majority of our explosive below grade, and let's say 50 to 70% of that blast hole has nothing but stemming in. We're definitely going to get oversized there, but as we increase our stiffness ratio, what happens here is that the amount of extra explosive we're adding as we make small incremental steps is much faster than the expansion we can have of the spacing until we get to somewhere around a two to two and a half stiffness ratio. And again, that's where that equilateral triangle pattern is typically used with the 1.15 uh, times the burden for our spacing design. But if we start increasing beyond that, we can actually open up the spacing more and now at this point we're starting to say let's say 85 percent of that borehole is filled with explosive and for each incremental increase to the length of that borehole or the length of the bench we do not necessarily see a huge change in the amount of explosive being used so here we have a very fast increase to the explosive quantity here we see a slower increase to explosive quantity but we get a faster increase to the spacing now what we can say is that the lowest cost for the uh, power, just on a powder factor basis would be at a four. However, we have to consider the initiators and the boosters that we're going to use. And then with that considered, we typically see the majority of sites, the lowest cost blasting is somewhere between a stiffness ratio of three and a four. And that's going to give us some of the best performance we see as well. Normally, like I said, we don't go over four because we can reduce the cost by going to a little bit larger diameter drill and coming back down to a stiffness ratio of four. So how does stiffness ratio tr actually help with treating oversize? Well, when we have a low stiffness ratio, we classify that as a short bench. And what happens there is it leads to cratering of the shot. And this is just a typical example of a crater from a, uh, it's actually from a military textbook on blasting. And you can see here, we have the depth of burial here, and that's where the charge sat. We're breaking below grade. We're getting some fractures extending out, but let's say we had another hole over here, right at the radius of that hole. And this is also some of the problems with using cratering theory uh, for blast design. But let's say we went to the radius of this actual crater. We had another hole in here and that broke up. Well, in that case, we'd still have this spot here that may be somewhat damaged. Maybe it's a little fractured, but it's still not broken. It's not necessarily diggable. Maybe we shear across here. And in that case, we have oversized occurring between the boreholes at or um, right around the actual grade. And this isn't just sort of our theory on it. We can also look at models such as the Coos Ram model, which is a internationally developed model between the, uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, with Kuznetsov developing the first part of it, and then the South Africans and AECI uh, developing the second part of that in terms of the actual uh, distribution function and the application of the Roslyn Rambler formula. So let's take a look at the same model. All the blast design principles are 100% identical. The only difference is in the stiffness ratio or the height of the bench. Well, when we have a stiffness ratio of one, we have this red line here, and you can see that 90% of the material is less than 100 inches in diameter. That means 10% of the material is over 100 inches. If we were looking at, let's say, like a 24 inch size here, or 0.6 meters, 
we would have roughly, let's call it 35% of the material from this blast would be uh, above roughly 24 inches. Now, when we have a stiffness ratio of four, again, nothing else has changed here besides the length of the borehole. We see 100% of the material smaller than, we'll call that roughly 60 inches or so. If we go back to our 24 inch mark here, we see that roughly 15% of the material passes 24 inches. So again, with changing nothing else, we've already eliminated 20% of the oversize from the shot just by having a higher stiffness ratio for the blast. And so now we'll come to poll number three here. And this is just gonna be a yes or no question. And it's, it's more of an opinion question. And the question is, can you overcome oversize by hiding it in the bottom of the muck pile? Because cratering will lead to breakage of the stemming. There's no question. We'll pop that entire top right off. We'll send it flying through the air. We'll have a violent blast, but it'll, it'll move that material and break it. And what happens now is instead of seeing that on the top of the muck pile, we'll get that in the bottom of the muck pile. So is that overcoming oversize? Great. Uh, so the poll is live. Um, we'll keep it open for a few seconds here. In the interest of time. Great. Definitely. It's, it's by far, there's a straightforward answer here. No, <laughs> I've yep. never seen a one-sided response. <laughs> this hundred percent. Thank you everybody for engaging. We'll continue. Yeah, and that, that applies, that's the same answer to that question then, is bigger always better? Is going to a bigger diameter drill always better? Not necessarily, especially if it causes this cratering to occur. And remember that stiffness ratio is a function of burden and bench height. So as the drill diameter gets smaller, as the explosive diameter gets smaller, our burden also gets smaller, and that allows us then to increase that stiffness ratio. So sometimes a smaller drill is going to be the better option. Next, we'll look at oversize from the outside burden, and we'll go through this section pretty quickly. I see we're coming up uh, towards the end of the hour here for the call, so we'll move through this uh, a little bit quicker. Now, the oversize from the outside of the burden, that's in this general area here, and that's going to typically occur as a result of backbreak from the following shot, or from, excuse me, from the previous shot. So we had a shot up in front, it broke back, this is the new face, and if we're getting oversized from this region, it's because we caused fractures to extend into this material. And now this explosive really won't have much of an impact here because those fractures that are now extended from the previous blast are gonna stop the fractures occurring from the borehole here. If we get back break, there's no real method for reducing this in oversize, uh, this oversize from the actual blast that we're about to fire. Instead, what we have to do is we have to correct the next blasts performance so we can minimize the back break and stop this from occurring in future blasts. So I'm working right now on a project and they did blasting there 50 years ago and we're, we're now coming back in and we're cleaning up the area. We're doing some more excavation. It's a construction project. Every single shot, the entire face has tremendous amount of back break. And so all we can do is push that rock forward and we have to deal with it on the ground. We can't break that today unless we could get, let's say, explosives directly in contact which would be very expensive to do. Now, back break can happen for a lot of different reasons. We typically have three major events that occur though. The first is over confinement of the shot. The second is we have cratering occurring, which will almost always cause back break. We could see in that crater profile, just the general procedure and mechanism of it, it's gonna cause back break to occur because it breaks in a 360 degree arc. The last one is gas injection into soft seams, meaning we have a soft seam of rock, we have mud, we have a cave, we have something that's, that's much softer than the rest of the rock, and the gases from the explosive will move in there, and it pops that seam open, which can cause a back break to occur. We've already discussed cratering here. Now, gas injection, we can typically handle that through stemming or decking through soft seams and by avoiding overloading. So in order to treat backbreak, what we're gonna talk about here is dealing with over confinement of the blast using what we call the 4D energy principle or the 4D approach to blasting. And to do this, we need to take into account both the confinement, uh, the complete confinement, including both the burden and the timing of the blast. 
Here's an example. This is a, a mine that we were working with. And because of COVID, we were actually not able to travel to the site at the time that we were working on it. And so what we did was we used Strayos. We had an on-site team come in that was local to the area. They could fly a drone and get us our profiles. And we were told, you know, the profiles were nice and, and smooth and there was no real concerns for back break or large toes. And this is what we actually got. Now, this blast was being designed for a 12-foot burden. So you can see here we had 12 feet of burden at six feet from the top of the hole. By the time we got to 32 feet down, we had 32 feet of burden. You can see we had major back break occurring here, and that was leave, leading to a very large toe burden, which gave us large uh, over potential over-confinement problems. Now, in terms of designing burden, designing the base simple burden is relatively easy. There's a lot of different ways to do it. There's the general rules of thumb. There's the Konya burden formula that people use. Um, but... In the end, that's sort of the easy part. The difficult part is that we normally don't get to apply our perfect design burden because we have real field conditions, for example, such as toe burdens. And so we need to, first off, be able to correct potential problems with toe burdens. And in eliminating that back break or in, in solving some of those back break problems, we can actually start to address that and smooth this face up so we have very minimal, if any, real toe burdens. You can see in this case, even if we came and put the hole right on the crest, we would have still had, you know, let's say this is six feet here, maybe this is four feet, we would have still had 28 feet of burden on a hole that should only have about 12 feet to 13 feet of burden at the maximum. And so in this case, we can't necessarily use our normal design approaches here. Now, we can use a lot of different tools, um, such as pre and post blast cross sections to help identify the extent of back break. And this is a, just an example from a uh, Strayos project. And you can see here, we can look at where the holes are. Uh, we can line up the cross sections of the actual original bench and then the post blast profile. And we can see then by lining up where our last set of holes was with the cross section, the potential extent of the back break from each shot. And that should be something we're measuring. We can directly pull those numbers and figure out what our total back break is. That should go on every single blast report. Back in the day, we used to use uh, large boulders. We'd put them two burdens behind. We'd spray paint them red. We'd have to measure it out. And then we'd try to figure out exactly where to measure from. Um, this makes it much simpler when we have some of these different tools to use. Uh, but those old techniques can still be used if, if we don't have, let's say, a drone available or something. Now, while we need to deal with toe burdens, and there's a lot of ways to do that, we can use a trim shot, we can use angled holes, we can change the timing to shoot it in a different way. Um, we, we have a lot of tools at our disposal and we can typically find ways to deal with these different toe burdens. However, there's one thing that we still have to address and that is improper timing that results in a large uh, burden or an over-confined situation. And this is a really good example here. We can see in the background, we're having material flying out. This is a pretty violent blast. We can see the face is barely moving compared to the top of the shot. And we can see cratering directly occurring, for example, in this region here. However, when we look into the foreground, this is not a stemming problem here. Most people would identify this as a stemming issue since all the boreholes are ejecting. It's not a stemming problem. This is a timing problem. Do you notice how the blaster here timed it so this hole here is firing at the same time that this hole here is firing? That means that this back hole here feels one, two, three, four to five burdens of material in front of it. So this is designed to have a set burden. Let's say that burden is 10 feet between these holes. It actually has a 50 foot burden, 40 or 50 foot burden because there's no relief. Remember, each of these holes has to fire, move the material out, and so that way the next hole in the next row has exactly the same burden as the previous. And when the timing is wrong, we get situations like this occurring where we have a large over-confinement. And in that case, well, we have over a million PSI of pressure here. There's nowhere for that material to go except up. And remember, when we design stemming, we don't design stemming to hold forever. We don't design stemming to hold the entire load of the explosives. We design for the stemming to hold long enough that breakage can occur 
and the gas pressure decreases in the borehole. And so if we can't get that gas pressure decreasing through rock breakage, we have to have that stemming blow out. And there's no way to uh, eliminate that. Now I'll also point out one other thing here. You'll notice that the face here has not moved before the stemming has blown out here. So that, that is again, a big problem that's occurring. In this case, that's probably too large of a burden on this first set of holes. And that's why we're getting uh, no face movement really. Um, but again, the back holes here, that blowout is occurring because of improper timing and the over confinement that occurs because of that. And the end result is that the blast hole may feel two, three or more times the burden. Now I'm gonna show some quick videos here. Um, for an example, this is a case study from a project we were working in Saudi Arabia. And so this is a blast. This is before we came to the site here. And you can see everything fired very rapidly. Everything went straight up in the air. We had a lot of material vertically lifting and blowing out above the shot. This is a blast after we uh, redesigned at the site and you can see the blast is gonna go off right here in this upper bench. So you can see that one rolled smoothly, fell out in front, didn't have any issues occurring. No vertical movement or cratering occurring. And this is the two examples of two different blasts. So we can see beforehand very violent blasting. Everything's cratering. You can see individual craters here. This is that blast I just showed you at the end there that's just smoothly rolling out from the face. Now these two blasts, exactly the same powder factor. They both use the same initiation systems, non-electric dual delay detonators. They both used ANFO. They used the same exact drill diameter. Now there were minor changes to the burden, spacing, some reorientation there, but the major difference here was solely the timing. You can see here in this top picture, you see how all of this is blowing out vertically before the face moves, including all of the holes going backwards. We can see some face movement here and everything behind it is going up vertically. And that's a timing problem right there. Well, you have to look at what the end results actually are. This is the previous blast, the one that vertically cratered. You see huge oversize here. They had some large shovels on the site that could barely dig the material. And you can see here, this stuff fell through the crusher like dust. We went from 10% oversize to less than 1% oversize just by making some changes in the timing, applying that 4D energy principle and making sure that we were not over confined from the blast in either the burden or in our actual timing and sequencing pattern. So that's the end of this session here. Uh, thank you everybody for attending and thank you again, Ravi and Kim and, and the entire Strayos team for having me uh, on to present here. Um, I guess from that, Ravi, do we have time for just a few questions here? Yeah, yeah. Th thank you for uh, the session today. I certainly learned a lot. You know, uh, sometimes you just do things with the software uh, side, but uh, what, what exactly happens on the field? Uh, there's a lot of eye-opening moment, uh, you know, for me uh, here. Uh, so in the spirit of kind of the audience here who has put the questions, we will take a couple of questions here. Uh, like we said, if we miss uh, your questions, you know, we will uh, draft a response and send it to you. But I will go ahead and moderate a couple of questions here, it's starting with uh, uh, here, any relations between bench height and number of rows taken? What's the optimal number of time the heights we are able to take in total burden for a blast? So that's a question from Michael. Sure. Is that, uh, Ravi, is that in the questions here? Just yeah. so I can pull that apart. It sounds like there's a couple there. Um, yep, yeah, I found it here. Yeah. So in terms of the bench height and number of rows taken, um, I there, there are some potential relationships there. What I like better than the bench height to the number of rows is the width of the bench to the actual number of rows. My typical rule of thumb is don't take a bench that has a width, so total side to side instead of vertical, a total width of 1.75 times the total depth of the shot. So we want that number to be greater than that um, because what happens is, is we can typically relieve a lot of material. Now, in terms of the set bench height to the number of rows, um, that 
depends a lot. And the reason that depends is it really depends on the overall stiffness ratio of the blast. So if we have a high stiffness bench, let's say a, a stiffness ratio of three or four, we know we can take deeper shots there than we can take um, with, let's say, a stiffness ratio of one or two. And the reason is, is there's a change of the inertia of the bench based on these different heights. Um, one of the common things that we talk about is in terms of stiffness ratio, it's similar to like slenderness ratio in civil engineering. When we're looking at columns or beams, the longer that column is, um, or let's say the longer the beam is just horizontally, it's a little easier to visualize, uh, the less weight we can put on the middle of it. The, the best analogy I have is take like a normal number two pencil. If you have a really small pencil and you try to break it, you can do everything you want, but you may not be able to get that to break. Or if you had a pencil that was, let's say, a foot long, you could grab both ends of that and snap that easily. It's the same thing with slenderness ratio. It's the same thing with stiffness ratio. So when we have a low stiffness ratio, let's say a stiffness of two. Now we have to really tighten up that overall width of the shot. Uh, and that's because we don't get the movement and the, the total ejection from each row. And at some point, we're going to start stacking up. Um, with that, there's also differences in the rock type. So, for example, in a hard competent, let's say granite or nice, we can actually typically take more rows because the harder rocks will actually respond better and move more than, let's say, a softer rock like a sandstone. There we may have to take less rows overall and, and tighten up the number of rows. Um, and that's because the, the softer materials have a longer response time and they take more time to move in general. Then let's see, what's the second question here? What's the optimal number of time the heights uh, we are able to take in total burden for the blast? Number of time. Um, I'm not 100% understanding that second part of the question. Ravi, do you... Um, yeah, we can perhaps uh, uh, move on to the next one. Uh, as, okay. uh, we'll reach out to Michael um, if we can uh, clarify more here. There is one, I think, just building on the stiffness ratio side. Uh, There's one question from Kahaya. That will be the last question we will take here. Uh, but essentially, we can't have ideal stiffness ratio when mining uh, from the low wall with multi seam uh, coal stratigraphy. Uh, and 30 80 meter burden uh, do you have any idea with this yep so when you when there's certain let's say geological limitations on the stiffness ratio especially balancing production with um, the the real world geology that you're seeing you can make changes to the overall blast design process so for example the videos that i showed here and the fragmentation there that you saw um, right at the end the stiffness ratio there was actually about a 1.7. So it was a very low bench overall. Um, th there's a lot of different parameters, one of which in, let's say, the timing, uh, specifically the row-to-row -row timing, there what we normally do is we have to actually increase the timing more and more. So the lower that stiffness ratio gets, the more and more time we need for the material. Again, that goes back to sort of the inertia of the bench and the time it takes to get that material moving. So when we have inefficient, uh, let's say, stiffness ratios, and we have to use those because of certain conditions, like we did there in Saudi Arabia, and it sounds like you have to at your site as well. Um, there's other design techniques that we have to target specifically for that. Um, and some of that is going to be what we call a multivariate blast design. And that is we, we really have to focus a lot on the site-specific parameters of that. There are certain groups of ratios. We talked um, in, in this webinar, we talked about some of the more simple terms and, and general blast engineering principles. Uh, there's other multi or excuse me, non-dimensional groups that we use uh, in that multivariate blast design approach that we so start to key in on some of these different principles uh, to actually go about doing that design. And, and then we use different software tools to further optimize their uh, as as we go through. Um, and, and that's just going to be the case. In some situations, we're going to have to deal with non-ideal uh, stiffness ratios, and we have to change our design parameters, uh, sometimes quite substantially. So for example, um, in some sites that I've worked in, especially with soft responding materials, so those weaker rocks that take longer to respond, um, we've ended up increasing our row-to-row -row timing to 40 milliseconds per meter uh, which is extremely long, but it's just what we saw from visual observation, from high-speed video, and then from the pre-post-blast analysis uh, that we had to keep increasing that and increasing that. 
Well, great. Uh, uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Konya, for uh, doing the webinar here. I think uh, uh, it was uh, amazing to see all those different examples and uh, like really going into the details. Uh, so thank you very much for the session. Uh, I'm pretty sure audience enjoyed it today. Uh, and thanks for sticking around longer as well. <laughs> uh, well, with the audience, uh, thank you for attending, uh, everybody. Uh, always great to see you uh, here. If you have a suggestions or comments or feedback about our webinar, uh, feel free to share with us. Uh, if you have suggestions about the new topics that we should cover, please also let us know uh, those uh, you know, topics. Uh, until the next one, thank you everybody and you have a great rest of the day. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you.